you can hear me okay, right? Why you come here, Jew? <laughs> Jew, Jew, dirty <laughs> little Jew, you. Jew. <laughs> you, Jew, hey, Jew. <laughs> hey, Jew, what are you doing? Steven. Mm. Oh, I caught you with the, <laughs> with the chocolate in the mouth. Yes. <laughs> Cheers to 30 grams of protein. <laughs> this all being healthier because we're recording midday. I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> oh, don't die on me. It's protein. So fair life. Aren't they the ones that were abusing cows? I, listen, we can have this debate on abused cows all day, considering that we stick them in pens, chop them to pieces, and eat them. Well, you do that. I mean, you buy cow wholesale, cows. right? Yeah, yeah, I buy the whole cow. All right. So, it's in my freezer right now. The last one we called Rogue I kill. mean, as long as we appreciate the sacrifice and the sustenance they provide, I think we're okay. You know, the Native Americans have something. You know, they, you ever seen the movie Avatar? Yes. I mean, I it's a cartoon, but whatever. Is it a cartoon? It's not a cartoon. Whatever. CG. But, you know, they, Show appreciation for their kill, you know? So, I mean, I appreciate the dead cow feeding me. Well, this one's not a dead cow. It's a live cow. That's a problem. Oh, so they're abusing it while it's alive. Yeah. How are you getting milk out of a dead cow? I don't know. <laughs> but regardless <laughs> of the fact, I mean, someone's squeezing your teats and forcing milk out of you. I mean. Well, some people is, pay extra for that kind of is action. Is there a nice way to do that? Squeeze someone's tits? No, the cow, man. <laughs> oh, you lost anyway. <laughs> Focus. Focus. All right. Well, I'll, I'll be honest. It wasn't the same doing a podcast without you. Yeah, I couldn't bring myself to listen to it, to be honest, because oh, I makes you sad. I was feeling a little. I'll be honest. It was. I like my, I'm, I'm I like sure. my own voice. <laughs> so, I hate my voice. So uh, speaking for about half an hour, uh, I, th I think it, w it went OK. I, I have uh, no doubt. I, I said some things that are, were important to me. I started listening to it and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's great. That's fine. I mean, you think about it. You go to a leadership conference. You're listening to one person talk anyway. Yeah. And you've done it. You know, you've sat in front of crowds by yourself, giving leadership, you know, speeches. So what's the difference? Yeah. No, I actually appreciate the, the opportunity to share some of those skills because we don't get to talk about some of those on a regular basis. We, we throw nuggets from them in, in our bigger conversations. Right. But really condensing into bullet points uh, was interesting. Anyways, I'll, I'm glad to have you back. So welcome back. I'm here. Because going, BK. <laughs> was not the same. going, Steven. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, you know, we, we chatted a little bit before about what should we talk about today. And we almost didn't want to talk about this. <laughs> no, we don't. Because, A, I feel like it's too early. Oh, and everyone's going to be talking about it. Right. And that's the other thing. Everybody's already talking about it. And people are asking for our opinion. So it's worth giving it. So I don't know that I want to spend the whole podcast talking about it. No. And here's the thing. I think people are going to hear what they don't expect to hear from us, too. Yeah. So, so what is it? What is the it that we want to talk about? So for our listeners, obviously, this is being recorded on a Thursday. Um, today is March 30th. The 30th. Uh, so this past Monday, uh, I'm sure everybody heard about it. But we had another tragedy with a shooting incident at a Christian school, private yes. school in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, by the time this come out, and this will drop on Monday, so it'll be a week from the date of the incident. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, those tragedies, unfortunately, are happening often. And we oftentimes like, get caught in the middle, and we take it from both sides. Uh, obviously, as security professionals, we, we get asked to, for our opinion. But also being, I would say, conservative in some of our approaches, political approaches, specifically when it comes to weapon ownership and so forth. We, we get some criticism about that and people ask for our opinion. So as much as uh, it may be too fresh and not all the information is out yet, a lot of information did come out really fast this time. Compared it, to usually, it usually does. But um, not everything is out yet. And I don't like being a Monday morning quarterback, but we uh, – We've been asked, so we'll talk about it for a few minutes and, and share our opinion. So let's start with the police response. Okay, so the the, uh, the body cam footage came out. And, and again, that's what I said came really fast. Usually you don't get those till a, a much later date, right, right, when they release it. It came out within a day. Uh, the two uh, officers that actually engaged the shooter. Right, and there was, I mean, if you really chopped the video up, there was probably a good number of officers in the school there was at least eight that i counted between the first floor the second floor scattered throughout the school um but the focus was on the two that 
engage and yeah. and people those are the footage yeah, that are released right? exactly and that's what people were asking me like but there were more officers there what about footage i said they only released the footage of the officers that actually discharged their weapons which is protocol right you know and that's one of the things i wanted to bring up too because this isn't that no oh, they're pretty good um but yes the other officers body cam footage would have been rolling as well but they did not discharge yeah, and, their and i'm sure the the attorneys are going to get those copies as well Correct. as they review the incident from different angles um but but yeah, the police response pretty quick. They, when they got on the scene, within uh, under a minute and a half, I believe they uh, found the suspect and mm -hmm. they uh, neutralized the suspect. People ask you about did they have to kill the suspect? I'm like, yes, yes, they had to kill the suspect. I do not believe in this individual just shot kids. Uh, they're still and, a threat. Yes, and, and you know, and I'm going to clarify your statement because it is constantly and commonly misconstrued as in. Oh, you just want to assassinate him, this and that. And I think a lot of people in the civilian world in particular don't understand the concept of completely neutralizing a threat and how they can still be a threat even if they're wounded. You know, this individual had the nefarious intent to take life, not to cause harm, to take life. And honestly, was not planning on leaving the place alive. No. So until the moment that they were put down, uh, they would keep doing damage. I mean, the person was well armed, two rifles and a pistol, if I remember correctly. Yes. Um, so they, uh, you know, they, they formulate simple. We talk about when we teach uh, active shooter response or active assailant response, as we call it, because it does not have to be a shooter, right? Um, they formulate simple. It's time equals lives, mm -hmm. right? The longer it takes to get to the shooter and stop the shooting, uh, the more people are going to die. So police officers acted really well. In yes, my yes. So, yes, they had to take them down. Yeah. You know, and just to add to that, a uh, few years back, I think you've been to the training as well. Actually, uh, um, Paul, one of our instructors, is an instructor at uh, New Mexico Tech. Yep. Right. So uh, we were doing the terrorism bombing um, class and the Montgomery County um, incident came up, the Discovery mm -hmm. Building. Yep. Um, and there was a D.C. paramedic in the class and he tore into the cops in the class. Why would you have to shoot him so many times? That's ridiculous. And this and that. And I said. You're going to see in a few minutes why those officers shot that guy so many times. And they did the suicide bomber vest mm -hmm. on the bus and uh, didn't say a word after that. I said, if those officers did not put him down, I said, this decisively, would have, yes, this would have happened. Yeah. I said, they intentionally had to neutralize him. And this is one of those similar situations might not have been a, a suicide bomber vest, but if, if his finger is still able to pull the trigger or her finger, Sorry if I offend anyone. But I know I know it was a transgender. I can't remember what. Yeah, I don't know what. specifically. Was so it male I, to female. Yeah, female to I male? don't know, and that's why I said him or her. I don't know the specifics on that. Um, but if I know for me and you and I, you know, we always joke. But if I'm still able to pull the trigger, I'm still a threat. Yeah. And this is why they have to neutralize them. This is why you saw that second officer yell, "Don't move!" There was movement. He engaged again. Done. Yep. End the story. Yeah, and and you know, not to rehash the Montgomery County, the Discovery Channel thing. I had the opportunity to sit on a debrief by the SWAT team right. leader um, that ended up making the entry. And actually, they were ready to make the entry much earlier and Correct. were stopped by an IROP that wanted a briefing right there and then. And they missed kind of a window of opportunity to probably take the person, um, I don't want to say alive, but with a lot less um, violence because they realized that the explosive was not armed but by the time they made the entry it, it was it was already armed and they had to engage as uh, aggressively as they did so the, their main i don't want to call it criticism because honestly i don't see any criticism the main um issue that i see with this event in in nashville is how long it took police to get there and, and no i'm not trying to Rag on the police. By the time the call comes in, by the time mm -hmm. they there's a whole they, they move and get to the right, get on location. Whatever. It takes time. Yes. Right. Uh, we know we live in a metropolitan area. To make it through traffic from mm -hmm. point A to point B, even with sirens and lights, uh, will take a little bit. But uh, thirteen minutes. That's a long time. That's a long time, right? Virginia Tech, minutes when seconds count. Yep, and and that's the saying, right? Uh, you can count on police. Uh, yeah, when you know, police minutes is, away, police are minutes away, count. right? When seconds count, and and that's and that's a bigger issue. So, um, and just to add to that, real quick, and not to lose your train of thought, because I know we both lose our train of thought really easy. Um, I want to give credit because I don't think enough of it is. I know it's slowly coming out to the school. 
Uh, I know there's certain policies and procedures in place, but they locked down the school. There was audible alarms. Granted, and we're probably going to get into how they could have prevented it or at least hopefully have prevented an incident like this altogether. But um, if you look at the video, there is uh, one of the staff members outside. She, did, I think she did a phenomenal job briefing the officer as he came in. She was standing by with keys, which I hope she got out of a Knox box that was there or she had on her person. She was letting them in. And I do believe that that contributed to a lot of lives saved. Yep. Um, their, their, their response to that, because you talk about 13 minutes. Um, that's a lot of time. So, and again, I don't have all the information, so I don't want to make assumptions. I don't know what happened th- during those 13 minutes, right? right? But but I, I think this is where I want to spend a little more of a conversation on, not necessarily about the Nashville incident per se, but what can organizations, schools included, right, can do during those 13 minutes, right? You're waiting on the police officers, and, and that's, that's great. Wait on the cavalry, right? If you are not for being armed, uh, which... I don't necessarily agree with, but to each their own. How can you heighten or elevate your safety and security throughout that period of time? And the one thing that you and I always say when we teach, I have significant uh, issues teaching active shooter response. I think the term alone is flawed. Mm-hmm. When we teach response, we are being reactive. Right, we're means, already behind the curve. Yeah, we, we're assuming, okay, we have a shooter in the building. What do we do now? It should be active shooter prevention. Prevention, exactly. And that's what we teach, right? So how do we how do we not let the shooter in to begin with? And, and I don't know if you heard, and I heard this from uh, my own kids' school administration because they've actually you know called me in to assist as well, and hopefully Masada will assist in building their prevention program now, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, but he said, uh, and I think I read this somewhere as well, where the shooter was actually um, doing surveillance on another school as well and actually chose – this school um because of the easier target the softer target interesting so i don't know that's honest truth i understand that the student was a prior student right the, the shooter was a prior student at this mm-hmm. school and my uh my understanding is that the target was was kind of pre-chosen in in that sense yeah. right the, so so again more good. information coming out we yep. don't know um i've i've heard it twice now that uh, there was a surveillance on multiple institutions but this other institution specifically had armed security officers yep. and uh, basically had the perception of a harder target. Right. So when we talk about hunting the target, so let's give our, our listeners a little of, of uh, I would say, a minor educational process in security basics, right? So yeah. there are a few, a few terms that we like people to know. First of all is the three variables that every ill-intended individual needs in order, in order to succeed, right? They need motivation, capability, and opportunity. Yes. And two of those we cannot control. I cannot control someone's motivation. If this shooter, for example, had a beef against a school, against someone specific at the school, right? We can't control that. No, we cannot. Um, we can control the capability. If they are armed, unarmed, if they have the skill set, do not have the skill set, we can't control that either. No, and just to reinforce that, because, you know, Obviously, the gun debate gets brought up on these situations mm-hmm. all the time. This shooter bought his guns legally. Yep. Okay. So any amount of gun laws would not have made would a not have made a difference. Right. So can control capability, cannot control motivation. The only thing we can control is uh, opportunity. Right. And by minimizing opportunity, we are hardening the target. Right. We essentially what we do what's called transfer of risk. Mm-hmm. So to your point, if this shooter served two schools and one seem to have a tighter security essentially that school minimized their opportunity and by doing so they transfer the risk to the school that end up being the target right so uh we always recommend our clients to minimize opportunity make themselves appear if nothing else as a harder target right, right. Uh, another term that we like to uh, uh, to explain is what's called the four d's of security deter detect defend and destroy right and by by that i mean what elements do i have to deter people from coming to begin with if they are coming how do i detect them as early as possible if they're in the building how do i defend against them and if needs be how do i destroy them and out of those the only one that's proactive is deterrence right detection defense and destruction are reactive in nature right so again the emphasis is oftentimes placed on the if you think about technology, right, people talk about uh, intrusion detection. They talk about alarm system, cameras, you know, all those things. Those are all reactive in nature, right? How much should they actually spend on deterrence uh, 
probably not enough. Right. right? And, and you look, I mean, even historically, and I, you know me with my military history, um, whether as you can go as far back as the medieval times, when, uh, even like crusades and whatnot, when they would go on campaign, you bypassed those giant forts, right? Yep. With the giant rooks and the, you know, you're going to go to the smaller, easier target because you know, there's going to be way too much assets, you know, dedicated to that. And you're going to, you're not going to be able to achieve your goal. Um, same concept, right? But one of the things we always come across and one of the resistance is what aesthetics, right? It looks so aggressive. It's, yep. it's not welcoming. We enough. don't want to look like a jail. Right. And, you know, I, I bring up a lot of points of my experience in Israel when, when you brought me there, how, Everything I never felt so safe in my life, first of all, um, regardless, you know, of this misconception that people have. Um, it, it's a country, you know, that is surrounded by its enemies, but you don't see the intrinsic levels of security, but they're there. Right. Right. There was no I never felt like I was in a fort. I never felt like, oh, my God, you know, there's I'm going to get hurt by some crazy security guard. You know, it was very subtle, but it was fortified. You know, so there's ways to do it. Yeah, one hundred percent. So a lot of it is cultural, no doubt. And and I always hate comparing apples and oranges. Israel, I, I know, I knew you were right. going to say that. <laughs> yeah, because Israel and the U.S. are different. You know, to to your point, Israel had an event in the late nineteen seventies. We it wasn't an active shooter. It was a hostage situation at a school up north in a place called Malot, uh, where terrorists took over a school over a weekend. Kind of hit a jackpot in a sense. It happened to uh, be used as a retreat that weekend. They took all the skilled hostages. Israel did not have a dedicated counterterrorism or hostage rescue uh, unit at the, at the time. But, right. One of the results of this event is the creation of such unit, uh, the Yamam. Uh, but at the time, our version of the uh, American Delta Force, right? So the Israeli version of them uh, tried to do the hostage rescue. Didn't go very well. We lost a lot of kids. We lost of stuff. We did get the uh, terrorists, but it was a very high price that was paid. Uh, Almost the next day, we have an armed guard at every school, yeah. and we don't get active shooter events. Right, they don't happen. Right. And and you know, say what you will about gun controls and so forth, but the presence of an armed guard at the entrance to every educational institution in Israel and shopping mall, and shopping mall <laughs> and restaurants, right? So so yeah, we we deal with terrorism, but you don't have these crazy lunatics going in because, again, the targets are hardened and, and not just. Just to, to to clarify, it's not just Joe Schmo who got his security license off the sleet carrying a firearm. These are trained professional security. Yeah, they have to go through some significant training. Uh, Israel is actually, uh, as opposed to common belief, pretty heavily regulated in terms of, of uh, handgun permits. Yes, I learned that. And uh, the security, uh, to have a, be a security guard, uh, there's a qualification process yeah i pulled up the statistics on countries with some of the strictest gun controls and i have to say i was surprised yep. that israel was like in the top five yeah not to say that it's impossible it's only possible to get it there are um what's the word i'm looking for provisions for right. for certain um geographical areas that you live in certain professions and so forth but at large uh the majority does not carry uh personal firearms with that said, we have a large military population, and they do carry the firearms on with them. So when I went on leave on a weekend, I right. would have my rifle with me. So that is an automatic expansion right. or an extension of that uh, that security blanket, right? right. Uh, the other point, and this is probably where we uh, we like to spend most of our time when we teach and when we do security and vulnerability assessments is the approach of what's called concentric rings of security. Right. And the idea is as we get closer and tr closer to the asset we're trying to protect, security gets tighter and tighter, right? So if we look at a school, for example, having a, a perimeter kind of fencing, right? And as we get closer, uh, there's walls and windows. And as we get closer, there are maybe badge or some sort of a credential um, passage or access control, right? And and then the classrooms themselves have some right. way to uh, control the door and, and secure it locked, right? So as we get closer and closer to the asset, in this case being the students, security is tighter and tighter. And recently we had the opportunity to do assessments on a few schools, uh, formally and informally. And I think this is where a lot of them are lacking. There's maybe, maybe access control to the building and that's it. Uh, there's no rings. And, and the idea behind rings is, 
you may pass the first one, but it's going to get you think. But it's like, by the time you get to the second one, you think a little more. By the time you get to the third one, you may give up. Right. Uh, by, by us not putting those rings into play, we missing opportunities to deter right. someone to begin and, with. And not only that, like that first ring, and, and I think w- when we did this at one school in Texas, um, it, it, it's almost like a sounding alarm, right? Because that first ring is there for a reason. If anyone crosses that ring without the proper procedure, you know, alarm bells should be going off. Right. You know, what's going on here? I need to respond to that. And, you know, and if you don't have that ring, then you miss that opportunity. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. And and a big a, a big concept that, that we like to push is uh, what we call security landscaping, right? So right. I, I do understand that schools will work a lot with hospitals, right? They don't want to look like jails. They don't want to have fences around. Mm-hmm. They want to be welcoming and open. And I understand because you got to balance. They are a business. Right, so we got to balance their business needs with their security needs, and and, and too, and I'm gonna play devil's advocate here, um, because I, you know, we both have kids in mm-hmm. private schools, right? <laughs> yep. So in 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 actually private, so we we'll look at security as a selling point, but you know, you have to consider um, the mental health of a child too. You know, they can't walk into a prison. School is supposed to have this, you know, concept of escape from home. I can be with my friends. I'm safe, etc. I see what so, you're saying. So there has to be that balance, right? Yeah, I never thought of it from the standpoint of my kids because I don't really care what they think. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm more about. I want my kid to be safe. So well, and I put that fence up. I'll be honest. Um, this one in particular affected my son. Mm-hmm. Um, he has really bad anxiety now. He, he was crying in class. He was terrified throughout the whole day that something was going to happen. You know, I talked to him. I, I told him I, I spoke with the administrative staff and they're taking phenomenal steps forward to for prevention. Mm-hmm. And I was super excited. You know, I, I've already told you we're going to Masada Taktuku is going to be assisting with this hopefully here very soon. And I volunteered. So one of the things I was very proud of, he goes in the interim while we wait to get this started, we're going to have every sorry. You know, I'm a fidgeter, man. I know. I, I got to stop your hand. I can't help it. I, I'm a fidgeter guy. Damn it. For those listening, I need to grab Steve's yeah, hands. I, I start. <laughs> Hopefully, if the dog comes through, it'll calm me down. But anyway. I'll give um, you a chihuahua. He, um, he reached out to the easiest resource, which was staff and parents mm-hmm. who can legally carry all right, and legally stand guard. And they're going to start a rotation of volunteers. At the school, playing clothes, That's awesome. you know, until they have their hardened preventing prevention secure play, um, yeah. procedures in place. Well, good on them, but that is not the common. Thing, it's right? not, but I'm hoping, you know, that this is going to be an eye opening thing for people. You know, we look at. I tell you, the problem is, and and again, I'm going to play devil's advocate to you for a second, but been in america since 99 so going on 24 years now and if there's one cultural are you legal yet i'm working on it okay yeah well Don't let me know me how it. it works out for you because i need to get started on the process <laughs> myself <laughs> uh, no the, the the idea is that i've it doesn't matter what happened and as long as i've been here and as long as i try to talk to people whatever the nature of people it's human nature in general but certainly here in america is people are reactive it's a knee-jerk reaction, something up, and the whole mentality of it's not going to happen to me right. until it does. And even then, a week later, people forget. I mean, do people even remember 9-11 anymore? I know, it's sad. Right? It, it's... So I did. I think your school is doing great, and I'm, I'd love to hear that other schools are taking note of it. But by the time this podcast drop. I know it'll be an afterthought. Yeah, it's going to be the next one. Yeah, this doesn't happen, right? Or wouldn't happen here. Which is interesting because I hate to say it, but American culture is a violent culture. I mean, society in general Mm -hmm. is a violent culture. You know, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We all live within our own tribes and our own countries. Biggest kid on the block. It's all about survival, right? We are a violent culture. You know, um, you look from from the past on to now, you know, societies uh, and countries, even the products we use every day were forged from combat. I always say this out of all that death comes our life that we live um, now. Um, and with that in mind, we still have that ignorant thought process of, Oh, it's not going to happen to me yeah, it's un- huh? until it does. Right. And, and you know, and not to get into the gun control argument, but to your point, exactly. Let's say you ban guns. Let's say you confiscate everybody's guns. Let's say that utopia that people want where there's no guns on the street, right? Actually comes true. Does that mean violence is going to stop? No, it's not. not. People are going to find some other tool. Right. Evil mind is an evil mind. It doesn't matter. It's been like that through history. There was always was a tool that created death. 
Right. You know, so it's not about the tool. It's about what are people doing with that tool? Right? We always say violence is, is a tool just like any other, right? We can use it for evil, mm-hmm. right? Which is why people associate with a criminal element and so forth. But we can use it for good. I can use a hammer to build a house. Or I can use a hammer to break down a house. It's the same exact thing. I can use that same tool, that firearm, to save lives. Correct. Right? And arguably, if you look at statistics, that happens a lot more than it is used criminally to take lives. Correct. Right? But people don't like to look at it that way. What is a, a meme I saw on social media today was um, a rock in the hand of Cain killed Abel, and that was bad, right? A rock in the hand of David killed Goliath, and that was good. Right. Same tool. It's not about the tool. It's not right. about the stone. It's how it's applied. Right. Uh, but going back to our rings of security, so one thing that we like to recommend is, uh, again, we said security landscaping is using uh, natural elements that mm-hmm. can aid in security. So I like using big boulders mm-hmm. to stop vehicles. I don't yep. like necessarily just putting ballards up. Correct. Uh, they don't look nice. Put a huge rock. It would stop a truck. Oh, yeah. Right? But it looks natural. Kids can play on it, whatever, right? Um, and then as you get closer to the building, again, those concentric rings, security a little tighter. We like uh, thorny bushes, mm-hmm. thick bushes. Nobody likes to walk through them. Mm-mm. You know, a bush of roses or hollies <laughs> look pretty. Yeah, I don't know anybody wants to walk through one right. or even drive through one. They're so thick, nothing mm-hmm. gets through those either. So you put those around the building, specifically under windows and so forth. Nobody gets in through those windows, right? Right. Uh, so we eliminate it a lot because people always think, okay, this building has so many secu- uh, entrances, right? Entry points. What they're thinking about is what's called actual entry points, doors, right? What they're missing is potential entry points. Right. Those windows, those hatches, right? And those still need to be protected. Correct. You know, it, it always baffles me, and I'm speaking about experience, empirical experiences, right? And some relatives, you know, that work in schools and stuff like that, and they say, well, I lock my doors to the schools, right? I'm like, but they're glass windows from top to bottom. What difference does that make? Right. You know, and we look at this incident, the doors were locked, they shot the windows out, you know, and there are um, the laminates. That yeah, la- yeah, different laminates you can put on glass to remedy stuff like that. But just that, again, back to the idea, right? Most of those are not, or all of them. I don't want to make the uh, generalization because I'm not sure, but certainly the big majority, vast majority of them is not going to stop around. They're going to stop the glass from shattering. Correct. But around would still travel through. So, But again, it's that concept of like, well, I lock my doors, but your doors are... 80% glass, you know, yeah. and things like that. So and it comes through. back to aesthetics, you yeah, know. Yeah, exactly. I don't go through your door. Then. I'm going to go through the window right next to it. <laughs> right. So, um, so yes, yeah, so people have to start thinking in terms of prevention. I have to start thinking, what can I put out there to stop people from wanting to come in? Again, that armed guard, very few things. Stops. I love canines. Mm-hmm. I think dogs are a huge force multiplier, right? Kids can play with them. There's therapeutic elements oh, in it, yeah. right? And I'll tell you, even the criminal element that does not respect the police officer, does not fear the gun, still fears the dog. Oh, yeah. Yep. So oh, I know. I've been bit by a police dog. <laughs> um, we used to have an officer that worked for us. They used to, uh, one of the institutions we work with, used to bring his, uh, his dog, his lab with him. And the dog was not trained for anything. It was just a pet, the, the most docile dog ever. But he put a little harness on it, like a mm-hmm. tactical harness and whatever. The dog just sat next to his legs, next to his feet. Nobody knew any better. No. <laughs> right? No. Um, and, and it's still a deterrence. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, again, just, just I don't want to say playing games, but having those elements in place work on the psyche mm-hmm. of the criminal element. Right. Right. In a big way. How many of these organizations do you think share intelligence? So... You know, we just had the opportunity to do a vulnerability assessment on a medical establishment. And uh, obviously, one of the fears, they, they were actually very well protected from an entering to the building standpoint. The problem is that once you were in the building, movement was pretty free and there wasn't a lot of control in that sense. So I ask, like, if you have an employee that comes to work one day and is off, you know, there's obviously some psychological change going on. And you don't know what goes on in people's life, right? What the triggers are, what they're dealing with at home, financially, personally, the wife left them, whatever, right? Any one of those can be a trigger. Is there a way to report it, document it, and follow up on it? And they did not have one. You know, I bet you some of these school shootings, unfortunately, 
you know, the app invited current students and former students, mm -hmm. right? Starting in Columbine and moving on up, Virginia Tech, so forth. Somebody should have picked. I mean, if you see a picture of the Columbine shooters a year prior and they look like these good all-American kids and then you look at them as the, the shooting date advances or gets closer or the date they actually executed their, uh, their malicious acts, they look at completely different peoples. There was a right. transformation, right. A psychological transformation that manifested itself in a physical manner. Somebody should have picked on it. Somebody should have followed. And, and, and then that starts a whole other debate, right? Of mental health. And, yep. and again, I, I, I think, and I've said this before, right? Um, I think we're doing a better job of recognizing the issue. What we're not doing a good job is having the infrastructure to intercept, in yeah, treat, etc. Because exactly. you get into privacy issues, right? Where where do you draw the line? Why right. do you let, and and there's always going to be a trade off. The more safe I want to be, the higher the security, the less freedom. And not only right. that, you know, we can keep going with the not only that, not only that, not only that. But you're going to have you know educational staff members, right? Teachers, whatnot. A lot of them are going to say, that's not my job. That's not my job, right? But then I'll counter with, well, you know, when I started law enforcement, it wasn't my job for to, to assess mental health, you know, over 20 years ago. But now we have crisis intervention teams. I got trained in crisis intervention, you know, to pick up on, you know, someone who was in mental crisis and follow up on them. Now we have dedicated units who basically monitor people, you know, who are in mental crisis. Um that wasn't our job then, but it is now. And I think there needs to be a shift, right? A cultural shift to address the needs of society. You know, change is inevitable. Right. We just have to be open to it. Right. No, I agree with you 100%. And it, it is a challenge. It's a problem to get that intelligent element in place and acted upon and followed up through, right? So, it is. It's, um, it's a big issue. Big problem. But, but there's got to be a process that is put in place just... You know, even if it's informal in the sense of, I, you know, they, they, they see something, say something type thing, right? Mm -hmm. So we have it plastered all over, over airports and whatever from a terrorism standpoint. What's the difference at a school if I see one of my friends, you know, that is obviously not being itself, not for a day, not for a week, for a month now, he's not himself. I should be empowered as a student to go and say something to a teacher. And that teacher should be empowered to go and say something to maybe a counselor. Right. And that counselor should follow up maybe at home and see what's going on. And, and I have no doubt that's probably has happened that we just don't see it. You know, right. obviously we, we're not seeing the statistics. We're not seeing the stories on it. Yeah. So I, uh, I don't disagree. I, I, I would be curious to see like this recent shooting in Nashville is a perfect prime example of uh, if the person was a student there at the school prior, what kind of information? Yeah, student, yeah. yeah. What kind of information do we have from there? time as a student what kind of follow-up happened after uh the student left right? right um you know this school is also unique very similar to the other school we did an assessment on recently in the fact that it is a religious institution on mm -hmm. top of it right it creates a whole new set of problems in in the sense of targeting i mean a lot of both our kids not only go to private school they go to religious private schools each it's on the denomination right but right. But they may be targeted because of that, right? Not, right. So um, they may be an outsider to the school, but because they're Jewish or Christians or Muslims or Sikhs, right? So the Sikh uh, had an issue a few years back, well, right? I mean, the Amish. The Amish, have, they, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in Pennsylvania. So, yeah, we... We need to keep track of things like that and mm -hmm. act on it. And there's resources in place also with law enforcement and fusion centers, and there's mm -hmm. resources for schools to stay connected to those um, to those resources, those federal, state, and local resources. I think most institutions do not take advantage of them, unfortunately. No, I, I know uh, some, I know here, um, every school, it wasn't like that before, but every school, regardless of the grade, now has school resource officers, you know, uh, at a minimum one. In this but, county? Yes, but the, at least two now. Oh, interesting. And, and yeah, and that was uh, the current administration's, one of their primary goals. They doubled the SRO unit and they have SROs that are well-equipped. I'll just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. uh, and well-trained. And uh, they are, they are the liaison, like you mentioned, for intelligence. You know, they get their intel briefings on the schools, et cetera, and they can request additional resources to have that 
prevention and perception oh, perfect. and fortification, which that that's one thing I can say I'm proud of with that. Oh, that's awesome. Having been a part of that institution. So, so my daughter goes to a public school in, in her county and they have a school resource officer. Um, she added a middle school. She has it at high school. I don't know that she had one at elementary school, though. And I don't think that has changed. I'll be interested to look into that and check. I also think that uh, just talking to my daughter about what kind of drills they do for an active event and there's, let's just say that there is room for improvement. <laughs> and there <laughs> usually is. Uh, there's and, always room for improvement. Right? Right? Always, goes, always the student, never never. And going back expert. to the mindset, though, because we offered our services for free. I mean, granted, I have a vested interest in the school being safe. My daughter mm -hmm. goes there. I'll, I'll come and do training for free. I'll come and provide. And not to go against local law enforcement, use me as a resource in addition to. Right. Uh, no, we don't need you. We know what we're doing kind of mentality and mindset. So can't do much against against and, that. And there's something to be said about that too. And we've talked about this right with instructors. And I'm not trying to change the subject, but a lot of institutions will look to local law enforcement for training, and some do great training. Um, I know um, the one I the institution I used to belong to, we provided you know education and assistance to institutions when it came to that. The problem is, is like it doesn't matter if you were a tier one special forces operator, police officer. I don't care. It doesn't mean you're necessarily a good instructor or a good security professional. Because Correct. You're looking at it from a different angle. Exactly. And that's that was my next point. They're they're going to present it from a law enforcement standpoint. And, you know, we've made the transition. Right. We are at least mentally and physically from a law enforcement standpoint to the civilian security aspect, you know, um, and you have to be able to articulate those skills to the civilian population, you know, because they're not going to have the same response. They don't get the extensive training that, right. you know, a, a professional does. So that you come as a police officer, not you personally, but, you know, I, I know that when I, with my agency, we, we have to go to this, the local school and, and do a briefing and do whatever. We look at it from, okay, what's going to make our life as a responding police officer easier right. with the events? We're not looking at it from the standpoint of, how do you keep the shooter out? What do you do internally right. in those senses, right? And what's best for the students necessarily? Because there may be a conflict there. That academy needs to be gapped somehow. Right, right. Um, and, and more law enforcement and security professionals need to kind of learn from each other. I mean, there's stuff to be learned from both. Absolutely. I, th it needs to be a, a multi-tiered um, education. Interdisciplinary. Response. Yes. In interdisciplinary. Oh, that's fancy. That's a big word. Interdisciplinary. Yeah. It yeah. just happens to be my major in school. Kind of, I, I kind of have a build my own. Yeah. You went blank. <laughs> yes, that's it. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> All right, well, I think we could uh, easily go on this conversation forever and start going different rabbit holes and oh, God, uh, yes. tangents. Um, but if you are a listener, um, you know, the, the, the Jewish business part in me say calls us if you need help. Yeah. But honestly, uh, we're here just to to enhance your life and, and make you a little safer, a little better. Take the information that we share with you. Go to your organization, be it a school, a hospital, a corporate building. If you're working at home from a home office and figure out how can you make yourself appear as less of an attractive target compared to yes. another similar entity. And it almost sounds bad to say, because you tell a school, okay, I need you to seem to be safer than the school right next to you. So if there's a shooter, it doesn't count to this school, it goes to that school. It sounds almost unethical, but at the end of the day, you can't protect everybody and everything. So you have to have faith no. that that school is doing what they can to keep themselves safe. Yeah. It, you know, and, and just to cap it off, you know, I, I saw a quote and I mentioned this to you. And, and again, I, I think once the officers were on scene, they were on point. I, I was yep. so proud of the response. I was jumping out of my seat like, hell yeah, get some. Um, and someone made a quote that, you know, these officers set the standard, right, for active shooter response. And my counter to that is there shouldn't be a standard. All right, it should never get to that point to begin. Also, with. don't know that, that that is necessarily. If you talk about from a timing and response time and so forth, I believe there were a few incidents. I mean, the, the incident here in Annapolis yep. response was within three minutes. Yeah, if that, and then we had an event in Ohio that it was under a minute. The right. response. And, and again, so, yeah. And what I what I mean by it is like. You know, it should never get to the point where officers are running to the side right. of gunfire. Standard shouldn't be measured by how fast I got to the shooter. It should right. be measured by right. how, how many are prevented. Yeah, yeah, how effective I was by not letting the shooter in to begin with. That should right. be the standard. Because, you know, at the end of the day, when we talk about schools, kids, and it was kids, six-year-old kids lost mm -hmm. their lives. That, should just, that shouldn't happen in society, period. Right. It should not happen. Uh, but it is, unfortunately. And 
we as professionals, whether you're a school teacher, tier one operator, law enforcement, it is our responsibility to protect them. Yep. Right? We're the past. They're the future. We have to take our you know, lessons learned and apply them. You know, enough's enough. You know, I, how many times are we going to let it happen before, you know, someone says, OK, this is what we have to do. And right. I, I think well, we're unfortunately, danger point, actually, we got to take guns away from people. <laughs> You know, well, I, <laughs> I don't know, leave it at that. Arguably, if there was someone with a gun at the entrance to the school or right inside the school or the teachers or volunteer parent or someone, maybe this shooter would have gotten far enough to shoot six kids. What if, what if, what if, what if, right? Right. All right. Steven, as always, it's been a pleasure. Always. See you next week. Next week.